for those who are joining us for the first time or even online, we've been doing a series on the book of James and uh, basically have uh, been going through all of James and we're up to the last part, chapter 5, and uh, we've basically gone through already looking at uh, faith under pressure, act on what you hear, uh, who is your favourite, uh, faith in action. We've talked about when you open your mouth, that was a good one, about the things we say. We've talked about living well and wisely and we've talked last week about drawing close to God. And uh, today we want to talk about the power of prayer. And uh, the reason we did the uh, church news now, uh, earlier on instead of uh, at the end, is that uh, we're going to have an opportunity for those who want prayer to be prayed for by the elders. And you'll understand in a moment as we look at this. Um, we've skipped a little bit of James 5, but basically we've caught, gone through the whole part. Uh, the start of James 5 I do want to skip, but uh, I'm going to read it for us anyway because I didn't think it's really important because it's talking about a warning to the rich people. Um, anyone want to be rich? You know, Truth is, if we're really honest, we're all filthy rich compared to the rest of the world and we do need to take part of it. So let me uh, have a quick look at this for a moment. This is um, the first part of James 5, and just putting in context as we head to our reading today. Look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with the anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away, and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those who have harvest your field have reached the ears of the Lord of the heavenly armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourself for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed innocent people. Do not resist you, who do not resist you. And uh, this sort of uh, pretty bold and powerful sort of statement, Jesus actually sums this up really well and uh, speaks of this. And you can see where James gets it from when Jesus says, don't uh, store a treasure here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there is your desire of your heart will also be. And James is reminding us right at the start of chapter 5 again that, that as a follower of Jesus, you've got to live and act as a follower of Jesus. The quick question as we just look at this, this is a free sermon, this is a mini sermon before the real sermon, but the question is, do you see your finances as yours or God's? Are you storing up your own kingdom? Because it's very clearly says, do not store up treasures here on earth Store your treasures in heaven and also wherever your treasure is, there is the desire of your heart will also be. And it's a bit of a challenge for us if we, we're really honest about just the stuff that we have and we accumulate. And uh, I know um, even, even Fran and David are talking about uh, uh, downsizing everything and, and it's, a, it's a massive job of going through and cleaning up that stuff. But where's your treasure? Is it with heaven, with Jesus or is it here on earth? We could spend hours on this one. I'm going to skim, skim through. We're going to keep going. This is the second part of James that I'm not covering, but I just want to read it this morning. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, be patient and you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For examples of patience in suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honour to those who endured under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, the man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him and in the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. But most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so that you will not sin and be condemned. And again, we could spend hours unpacking that, talking about Jesus' return, talking about our patience, talking about just being uh, letting our yes be a yes and our no be no. And uh, again, I want to encourage you to read through James again. It's only got five chapters. It's an easy book to read. Sometime throughout this week, I encourage you to reread the whole of James in context of everything that we've done. However, I want to keep going because I do want to spend the last uh, time, last, uh, time we have uh, looking at the last part of James chapter 5. So let me pray and then we're going to unpack uh, James chapter 5. Father, we want to thank you again for your word. 
Uh, we want to thank you that it's living, it's active. And Lord, as, you're, as it says in Timothy, that it does teach us, it encourages us, it rebukes us. And Lord, it brings us closer to you. And I pray, Lord God, as we unpack this last part of James chapter 5, that, Father, that you would speak to every single person here in the building, even those on the phone and computer and watching later online, that, Lord, our eyes, our ears, our hearts will be open to what it is that you want to say to us this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the reading uh, that uh, we're going to look at in just a moment is one that uh, has been read many a times in a church. And even here at this church, uh, we have tried to practice that in the sense that if anyone is sick and they want the elders to pray for them, we do that. And we also anoint with oil. But the thing about this is it often happens only every now and then. And I, I, I'm serious. Only every now and then people say, oh, can we actually have the elders pray for us? Uh, as it says in the book of James. As uh, what it talks about is actually anointing people with oil and praying. And uh, we're going to have a, a look at that now. So let's have a look. First of all, James chapter 5, verse 13, it says this. James concludes it by saying, Is anyone in trouble? He should pray. The NLT says, Any of you suffering hardship, you should pray. The message says, Are you hurting? Pray. So basically, James starts this section of scripture off by basically saying, uh, If you're hurting, if you're in trouble, if you're at the end of your ropes, whatever it might be, pray and if you're a follower of jesus this is not rocket science that whenever there's a trauma wherever there's trouble we should be connecting with the father we should be connecting with the father son and holy spirit in prayer and here at peel street we strongly believe in prayer we have a, a prayer meeting that we meet every fortnight uh on a saturday morning we pray we pray before the services we pray many a times throughout the uh, out the week and uh, in our church service, we deliberately still have time for prayer. You know, there's a number of churches these days who don't have prayer in their service. They pray every now and then, but they don't have a dedicated time of prayer. We believe strongly in prayer. In fact, it's one of our core values where we say we believe prayer is the foundation for all that we do. We believe that God always hears our prayers and answers them according to his will and purposes. We believe that prayer is the means by which we draw near to God and build a relationship with him. We believe that God works through the prayers of his people to impact the world. Prayer is a core value of who we are. It's a, it's a DNA. And, and I'll be very clear and say this is a non-negotiable. We will never stop praying. We will never stop connecting with the Father. And we'll never stop encouraging you and others to connect with the Father through prayer. Prayer is something that is personal. But it's also something that's corporate that we do together as the body of Christ. And James is reminding us right at the start, if you're in trouble, if you're hurting, if you're at the end of your ropes, then take it to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. In other words, what he's saying is invite Jesus into that space. Invite Jesus into that space. Remember that God is with you and that he is, he is wanting to be with you during this time. That you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to struggle alone. If you're hurting, if you're in trouble, if you're going through a hardship, invite the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit into that situation. During these times, I, I, whenever I, I, I do it, I know there's often encouragement and there's peace and there's a sense of, of rethinking through your mindset because suddenly instead of the focus being on you or the circumstance, the focus is now on the Father. But there's a danger that comes with this as well. Because often he'll not only bring peace and encouragement, but he also might bring accountability and conviction. And there might be things that he's calling you to do by saying things like, I'm, s I'm oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, it's a hard word to say sometimes, isn't it? I'm sorry, I stuffed up, I made the wrong call. Often when we pray, God convicts us of things that sometimes we need to say sorry about, we need to repent about. But James is reminding us that whatever we face, whether it's, whether it's a tough time, we need to pray. But he goes on to keep saying. So he says, if anyone in trouble, he should pray. But he goes further and even says the flip of it. He says, if is anyone happy, let him sing songs of praise. I love the NLT. It says, are you happy? You should sing praises. The message says, Don't, do you feel great? Then sing. There's this sense where James is saying, whether you're going through the toughest of the toughest time, connect with the Father. If you're going through a great time, enjoying life, then praise God. Let him know that life is good and praise him. Sing praises to him and let him know that you love him and that you're worshipping him. So no matter what you're facing, whether it's the trouble, whether it's the joy, connect with the Father. 
Now, again, it's not rocket science for those who are followers of Jesus, but dare I say, we often need to remind ourselves. I still find it fascinating that so many people go through sickness and doctor's surgery and things like that, and then finally they ring the church and go, oh, can you pray for us? But that should be a default right at the start. Let's bring God in. Let's invite God into that situation before we even go down the path of of seeking all the all the doctors and everything. I encourage you to still do that, but God should be there first. Paul reminds us in this when he talks about prayer. He says, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If you want to know the will of God, this is it. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, is to be joyful always, pray continuously, and give thanks in all circumstances of life. There it is. The will of God for your life. Pray continuously. Invite God into your life regardless of whatever it is you're facing. And as part of this, as we learnt from last week, and here's the test, James reminds us to submit yourself. Who remembers this memory verse? We, we remember this. Now, where, where's, um, where's Rob? Rob's not here. He, he whooshed, whooshed out. Rob was going was to do it. But who, who remembers? Submit yourselves. Resist, come, there you go, almost got it. Let's read it again. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. For those who are new, we we did that as a memory verse last week, purely because this is one of those scriptures that if you keep in your head when times of testing comes, this is one to grab onto. And I, I, I'd love to hear if, if this popped into your head any time during the week, because I guarantee it probably did. That we need to submit ourselves to God and resist the enemy. And it says that the promise is that when we do that, he'll flee. But then we come near to God and he'll come near to us. You see, James is reminding us it's about connecting with the Father. It's about staying connected with him. Again, as we looked at it last week, reminding us that uh, Jesus said this himself. He says, remain in me. And I'll remain in you, for a branch cannot fruit bear, produce fruit if it is severe, severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those fruit who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In other words, if you're not connecting with Jesus, if you're not remaining in the vine, then you're like a branch that breaks off and you're useless for nothing other than burning it in the fire. We've got to stay connected to the Father. And I want to suggest today that that we know it in our head, but with the distractions of the world, we can become so consumed with the stuff. Remember, he was talking about where our finances are and everything. We can become so consumed with the stuff that we actually are distracted and we actually disconnect from the vine. So I want to encourage you again that whatever you're facing, whether it's the good, the bad or ugly, we've got to stay remaining in the vine. And then we get to the part I want to look at today that James unpacks. So he's basically saying, whatever you're facing, pray, uh, whether it's happy, good or bad, uh, stay connected with the Father. And then he goes on to say, verse 14, he says, are any of you sick? You should call the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you've committed, check this out, if you've committed any sins, you'll be forgiven. But he goes on further in 16 and he says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So James is saying, if you trouble, pray. If you're happy, pray. Sing songs of praise and praise God. But now he's saying, hang on, if you're sick, if you're struggling with your health, then again, don't do it on your own. Invite Jesus into that situation by calling the elders of the church to come and pray over you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. You know, it's pretty clear what James is saying. The thing I love about the book of James, it's one of those most practical books. You don't need to be a theologian to understand it. It's pretty straightforward. And what we know as we look at the whole concept of of, of anointing oils, that uh, particularly in the Bible, um, oil is used a lot. Olive oil was one of the, the, I guess, the key um, ingredients in life 
uh, in, in biblical days. It was used not only for cooking, uh, but it was used for cosmetic. You know, the, the ladies would put olive oil all over their face. Um, anyone doing that this morning? No. Uh, but not only that, they used it for, for medicine. It was part of a medical treatment. In fact, we read in the Good Samaritan story when the, the, the Samaritan is helping uh, the guy, uh, it says he went to him and bandaged his wound, pouring on oil and wine. Um, they had this concept that oil and wine together were, were healing, um, able to heal, and he put the man on his donkey, took him to the inn. So oil was used not only for medical purpose, for, for cosmetic purposes, but it was also used for religious purposes in the sense of a, a representation of God's presence. Now, we don't have time to go fully into it, but it'll give you a snapshot of just how important oil was that there was point, certain times when God in the Old Testament uh, gave di clear direction about how to make up the oil that was used for a particular case and uh, how it was used. And there was sort of general oils. There was oils used for sort of anointing the person, but there was also oils used for anointing the tabernacle. And here we have in Exodus chapter 30, read with me, oh, I'll read along. It says, um, then the Lord said to Moses, take the following fine spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, Half as much as that are 250 shekels of fragrant cinnamon, uh, shekels of fragrant can, cane, uh, shekels of cassia, all according to the sanctuary shekel and a hint of olive oil, and make these into a sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blend, the work of a perfu perfumer. It will be the sacred anointing oil. Then use it to anoint the tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, and the table and all its articles, the lampstand and its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and the basin with the stand. You shall consecrate them so that they will be most holy and whatever it touches them will be holy. Anoint Aaron and his, son, his sons um, and consecrate them so they may serve as my priest. Say to the Israelites, this is to be my sacred anointing oil for the generations to come. Do not pour it on men's bodies and do not make any oil with the same formula. It is a sacred and you are to consider it sacred. Whoever makes perfume like, the, like it and whoever puts it on anyone other than the priest must be cut off from all the people. In other words, this is serious business. This oil is to be used in the temple for a particular purpose. And throughout the scriptures, as I said, we don't have time to go over the whole thing, but there's a pattern of oil being used as, as an anointing oil of God's presence, as God's covering, as God's uh, um, a symbol of his presence on his people. And we actually see this, that even when Jesus sends out the 12, in Mark chapter 6, we read this, that the 12 have gone out and they've done things in Jesus' name. It says here they went out and preached to the people that they should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people, sick people with oil and healed them. So there was a pattern of anointing with oil, particularly those who are sick. And I want to be really, really clear today and say the oil is not what's special about it. You know, it's not like you get the oil and it's a special oil, therefore this oil is the one that fixes people. It's a symbolism of what takes place. It's like when we get baptised, the water is not magical, it's just plain water, but it's what it symbolises that makes the difference. And by doing it in an act of faith is what God is saying here, that the oil is God's presence. So when James says such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well, and if you've committed any sins, you'll be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces great results. I actually love the message translation of this. I want you to really hear this as I read it today. Believing prayer will heal you and Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you've sinned, you'll be forgiven. Healed inside and out. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. The prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. And Lord, I don't fully understand it because there's a whole complication around this. There is a clear connection between those who are committing sin and living a sinful life and sickness. A number of times we read that Jesus made the comment for a person who was sick, he actually said, your sins are forgiven. He didn't even address the sickness. He talks about your sins are forgiven. We see this in Jesus healed the paralytic, the man who was paralyzed. We see this, so first, first uh, five, seeing their faith, 
Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. So he didn't say, get up and walk straight away. He said, my, your sins are forgiven. He goes on to say this. But some of the teachers of the religious law who are sitting there thought to themselves, what's he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Then Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, pick your mat and walk? So, I'll prove, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat and walked out through uh, the stunned onlookers. They were amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. This concept about receiving prayer requires faith, a sense of acknowledging that God is the one at work here. You know, and, and I love the fact that in the story of the man who was paralyzed, his friends knew that Jesus could do this to the point that they grabbed him. They couldn't get through the crowd, so they went up to the top of the house. They ripped a hole in the roof and lowered him into the ground to where Jesus was standing. They actually had a, a boldness in their faith to go, this Jesus can actually change this man's life. And I wonder today whether a breakthrough is needed in your life, that you actually need to have the courage to climb on the roof and rip a hole in the roof and step forward and say, Jesus, I think you can heal me. I know you can bring a change into my life. The issue is the scriptures tell us that if you're sick, call the elders to pray for you and anoint you with oil. And I think if we're honest, some of us wrestle with that. You know, we're happy to hear, you know, if you're, if you're troubled, then pray. Yep, I can do that. If you're having a good life, then sing praises to God. Yeah, that's easy. But hang on. If you're sick, am I prepared to let the elders pray for me? Because what happens if I don't get healed? The big question. You know, the truth is that we can't wave a magic wand and fix everyone's problems. And this scripture is not talking about the fact that if you do this formula of A, B and C, so you get the elders and anoint and pray, therefore you're going to be okay and everything's going to be honky-dory. It's got nothing to do, it's actually to do with the fact of inviting God into your situation. It's the fact of actually saying what we've been saying through the whole of James, less of me, more of you. Not my will, God, but your will be done. And I'm inviting you into this. I want to be healed. I want to be changed. I want this sickness to be gone. But I'm submitting myself to you because you are God and I'm not. And whether you heal me or not, or whether I walk out a different person or not, that's irrelevant because I'm a child of God and I know you're with me. And we have this barrier sometimes to prayer that we actually are just not sure where that fits. And here's the other one when we look at this James passage. Maybe there's unconfessed sin. Maybe there's stuff in your life that's holding you back from the healing that you desire so much. James says this, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So this is not just confessing your sins to God. This is confessing your sins to each other. Who's up for it? Confessing your sins to each other and you'll be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person is great and powerful to produce wonderful results. You know, studies have told us that people who um, have a whole lot of anxiety and stress and everything, it actually impacts your entire body. That if you're carrying that, your whole body is impacted by what goes on in your mind and even your thoughts and stuff. And I want to suggest even further that God himself knows that if you've got unrepented sin and there's issues in your life, that's going to play out in your body in some way, shape or form. And there's actually power and freedom in confessing of your sins, not only to God the Father, but to one another. And dealing with any conflict that is in relationship. Again, I'll just stick with the, if you're in trouble, pray. <laughs> and if you're happy, sing God, praises to God. This next bit gets harder. And I wonder deep down whether it's not so much we're worried to come forward and get prayer from the elders because of our faith might not be strong enough. I'm wondering whether we're worried more so about what God might do, what he might call us to do, that we might have to go and face someone and say, hey, I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? 
confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. As I said, I don't fully understand it, but there's a clear connection between confession of your sins and the healing that comes. You've heard the phrase, don't give yourself an ulcer. I think there's something quite biblical around that concept, that as we unload our worries, our burdens, our sins, the Father can then begin to bring healing into our lives. So the question today, are you wanting or allowing the elders to pray over you? I want to put some legs on this reading today. And as we've just said, are any of you sick? You should call the elders of the church to come and pray over you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, the reason why we had the announcement at the start and uh, um, didn't do the church news as we were planning is because I want to give you an opportunity that if you want uh, Fran and David, who are two elders, and David's back now, so it's working. Just the timing's amazing. I didn't plan this. Um, but uh, David's here, and uh, together, the three of us, we want to pray for you if you want to be. And we've got some oil here, um, and uh, what we do is we'll just put a little bit of oil and just put it on your head. We're not going to tip it all over you or anything like that. It's a simple presence of God. And what we're going to do is we want to do that together. So we're not going to have the three of us praying separately. We're going to pray together. So this might take some time, so that's why it could be at the end. So if all of you want prayer, that's fine. We'll stay here until tomorrow. I haven't checked with the elders, but we'll stay here tomorrow. But what I want to do is in a moment, we're going to uh, sing our last song, uh, which is basically uh, inviting God just into this presence to be still in the presence of God. And then for those who want prayer, I encourage you to stay where you are and at appropriate times, just come down the front and let us pray for you. And for anyone in the house who doesn't want prayer, and that's all cool as well, can just go out and enjoy morning tea. But as you sit, as you wait, if there's a whole bunch of people, I just encourage you to talk with God. Maybe this morning you need to go talk to someone or you need to get on the phone and say, hey, I need to talk to you because I need to confess some sin. I need to deal with the sin that's entangling around my body at the moment. Again, we could easily just read this and we can go home and go, yeah, great message, Tim. That was really good. Or we can actually put legs on it and live this stuff out. And my prayer is that people will be released of stuff today. People will be healed today whether it's a physical healing, an emotional healing, a spiritual healing, that their lives will be transformed because of the power of God at work. And it requires faith of you stepping forward and saying, yes, I want prayer. It requires faith for us as elders uh, to, and leaders to be praying for you. But to actually trust God and invite God into this situation and say, God, I'm in trouble, <laughs> I'm happy but actually there's some sickness in my life that I need to deal with and I'm going to follow this biblical principle and call the elders of the church to pray for me and invite you into that. So I want to encourage you to uh, stand and sing this song with us as we just invite Jesus into this situation. And for some of you, uh, you're wrestling right now, your gut's going, yeah, I want to, but I'm not sure. Let's just ask God to minister to us this morning. Let's sing this beautiful song, Be Still in the Presence of Our God. Father God, as we enter into a time of prayer, we pray that you would just minister to us and, Father God, that you would just give us a sense of your peace. And, Lord, if others are going to go and more enjoy morning tea, then, Lord, we thank you for our time this morning. And we just ask that you would minister to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for being here. If you need to go, go. But again, if you want prayer, we're going to just have it right down here and uh, encourage you to come down and uh, we're going to pray for you just here. God bless.